let's talk about right ventricular infarct. So before we get into it, why should you care if you're a paramedic student? Well, if you're a paramedic, you probably already know why, but say you're a paramedic student getting into this, you probably think you're going to be doing all kinds of car accidents and cool, crazy stuff like that that you see in the movies, shooting, stabbings, assaults, people falling off of great heights or whatever. Uh, what you see here in front of you is a contrast between deaths from heart disease and deaths from literally accidents. These are Canadian statistics. So about 70,000 people a year die from heart disease and about 10,000 die from accidents, which includes car accidents, drownings, traumas of any kind, assaults. Uh, it's all grouped in there. So that doesn't kill as many people as you think. If you're going to die, it's likely going to be your own heart. In particular, heart disease is generally caused by myocardial infarction in general. And then myocardial infarction leads to a whole series of diseases that do not have a good prognosis at all. Let's go over coronary arteries, or really we're just going to talk about the right coronary artery because that's what we care about. So the right coronary artery uh, goes off your aorta like the other artery, but it goes to the right, and the first thing it does is it feeds your SA node over here, okay, which will come into play later. And then it wraps around the heart, goes to the inferior or posterior side, and feeds the right ventricle, the majority of the right ventricle. So we'll just keep that in mind as we keep going. What is coronary artery disease? Well, it's a buildup of arthrosclerosis. It's a buildup of plaque within the wall. So your arteries get harder than they're supposed to be, meaning they can't expand and contract the way that they're supposed to, vasoconstrict and vasodilate, and also chronically inflamed, which causes damage. And then, like I say, the deposits of these plaque causes a narrowing, this yellow part, of the actual blood vessel. What causes coronary artery disease? There's an element of it that's genetic, so that's kind of hard to get away from. And then there's all these things, I'm not gonna go through them all, but the one I would draw your attention to is insulin resistance, because that's getting huge amounts of attention nowadays, and that's probably the best predictor, actually, of coronary artery disease altogether. What is insulin resistance? Well, that's more of a diabetes topic, but it is insulin resistance is essentially the disease of diabetes. So what is an actual myocardial infarction? Well, we talked about the plaque buildup, right? That arthrosclerosis, which is cholesterol deposits within the actual blood vessel. And that would be kind of that yellowish stuff that's depicted as in here, right? So you have your blood vessel, and then you have your plaque, right? Build up your plaque on either side. That's already not good for a bunch of reasons. And when you learn about coronary artery disease, you'll learn about that. But let's just talk about MIs. So the blood's coming this way, and not as much gets through as you'd like. Well, cool. If you've ever picked up a rock from the bottom of the river, you've noticed that it's super, super smooth, right? And that's because over time, the water has eroded that rock. The pressure from that water is great. Well, it's the same thing happening in your blood vessels. You are eroding that plaque over time. Now, we can handle that for a period of time, but what eventually happens is you get an actual breakage of the plaque. And then this whole area breaks off and moves farther down the line. So that's not good because then you have a, an actual piece of plaque, right, moving in your blood vessel, and that's going to clog up somewhere down the line, and that's not good. But that's still not generally what we're talking about when we're talking about infarction. So if you look at this area, this kind of where I scribbled all over the plaque here, now that the cap of the plaque is gone, what's underneath that? is you can think of it like Velcro. It's a very, very rough surface. And why we care about that is you have in your body, as you should already know, platelets. Platelets are supposed to find jagged surfaces and begin to aggregate in that area and begin the clotting process. If you think about it, you cut your arm, any type of traumatic injury, uh, you expose the blood vessels to the outside world, and in doing so, you create a jagged area, okay? The platelets find the jagged area, they aggregate, they begin the clotting process, and the bleeding stops. Problem here is that the platelets think that this part of the plaque is an actual damaged blood vessel, right? So they start to aggregate here, and over time, not in an extremely long period of time, but there is a window, it will build up an entire clot, like a proper clot. Once that's done, that's it. There's no more blood flow beyond that point. 
depending on where that plaque ruptured and where the MI happens, that can kill you instantly. It is one of the leading, it is the leading cause, sorry, of cardiac arrest. So we want to know where that's happening. Today we're talking about right ventricular infarct, so we're going to talk about that in the right ventricle. So you're immediately going to get no oxygen and no glucose. Well, okay, that means all of those cells are going to immediately switch to anaerobic mechanism to create energy, but that won't last very long, and there's no reprieve from that. There's no, in the field anyway, fixing that clot. It is That tissue is going to start to die, absolutely. So time is myocardium. You should know that by now. Time, time, time. That's why we have lights and sirens. That's why we try to do things quickly. That's why we try to limit our time on scene. And that's why the provincial bypass to the Heart Institute is 60 minutes. A quick recap of Frank Starling's law. So what it would say in your textbook, increased venous return results in increased stroke volume. Okay, so just picture, if you have our time with this, just picture a balloon. So you blow up a balloon with air and as you're blowing the air into the balloon, you feel the resistance. It gets more and more difficult to actually blow air into the balloon. So imagine you blow in just a tiny amount of air, right? And you let go. Well, the air will just slowly escape the balloon and that's the end of it. But what if you blow the balloon up to near its maximum capacity and then let go? The balloon will fly across the room. The reason the balloon will fly across the room in the second scenario where you blow it full of air is the elastic nature of the balloon itself. So the greater the resistance that has built up due to the air, the greater the contractile force of the balloon. Your heart muscle is really playing on the exact same physics here, okay? Your muscle cells have that ability in your heart, have that ability to stretch, and then when they find an actual outlet, like a valve opens up, that contractile force will be greater depending on the amount of blood in the heart or air in the balloon. It's the exact same thing. That Frank Starling law, that, that Frank Starling mechanism is happening in a constant basis in your body. Okay, so if you run up a flight of stairs and you push all the blood from your blood vessels into your heart, right, all your veins and your legs, all up into your heart, that return of blood stretches the heart and it assists in blood flow through the body. It's not the main mechanism but it is one thing that you have to keep in mind with right ventricular infarct. Since the balloon is dependent on the amount of air entering it for its contractile force, in the human body, we would say that the contractile force is dependent on the amount of blood returning to the heart. And then in this instance, that blood acts as the air in the balloon. So we want a fair amount of blood coming back into the right ventricle to cause that force. In Ontario, we have the ability to do 12 leads, but more importantly, we have the ability to uh, interpret 12 leads with a pretty good degree of accuracy, actually. So we can determine in the field if somebody's having a STEMI, uh, and, but more importantly, we can determine what artery is likely involved. And in the setting of right ventricular infarct, we can determine with really good accuracy if the right coronary artery is occluded. Now we already mentioned the right coronary artery feeds the right ventricle, uh, it also feeds the right SA. Um, so we're gonna talk about what that actually means if it becomes occluded and how Frank Starling's mechanism fits into that. So nice picture of the heart here showing blood flow through the heart. Doesn't show your coronary arteries, but we already looked at that. And you're right coronary artery will wrap around, kind of feed the picture of that red line in the back of the right ventricle and feed it. So let's say your infarct happens before that right ventricle. So we'll make that green just because it's a nice contrast. And that infarct happens here, so there's no blood flow to your right ventricle. Well, what is going to happen to your right ventricle? We kind of already talked about that, but it's not going to have any oxygen, it's not going to have any glucose, it's going to start to die won't die immediately, but it will definitely die. So that right muscle is going to fail in its actual contracting force. And eventually it won't be able to contract at all. So you will actually only see a mild decrease in ejection fraction. So there'll be some 
decrease in blood leaving the right ventricle, which is not good, but surprisingly, there won't, it won't be a complete failure, right? So you, you might get a little bit of fluid backed up into the inferior and superior vena cava, but it's not the end of the world. So if the right ventricle is not working at all, there is no contractile force and the cells are dead, how is it possible then that you could still be getting blood flow through the right ventricle? So think about that. You might say, well, the left ventricle is doing all the work, the left side of the heart. Well, you're not wrong. The left side of the heart is going to try its best to keep things going, but it can't really make the right side beat. Now, there is something the left side can do, and that's continue to pump blood through the body. So let's follow blood through the left ventricle, right? So left ventricle, aorta, your whole body. Then it gets picked up in the venous system and is brought back to the heart via the inferior and superior vena cava, right? The, 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 um, this area over here, right? Blue for venous deoxygenated blood enters into the right atria. So long as there's no failure of the left side of the heart or systemic circulation, then you're still going to have the same amount of blood emptying, emptying into the right atria and then subsequently into the right ventricle. The only reason you're not dead, this human being is not dead, is because of, and you probably have, have hopefully already thought of it, Frank Starling's mechanism. That's the only thing keeping this person alive. Okay, the heart muscle is dead, dying, but probably dead. Why do they maintain a blood pressure? Well, the blood is still being emptied into the right ventricle. The right ventricle is stretching. And then that contractile force, just from the sheer stretch, there's no actual energy used, is still contracting whenever the valve opens and blood is being pumped. So in the event that you have a right ventricular infarct, and in the event that it, your muscle is dead, it has progressed to that point, you will not immediately die due to Frank Starling's mechanism, which is good for you. So then, what does it mean to you, all this stuff? What does it matter to you that this guy is now depending on Frank Starling's mechanism? Well, that's why nitroglycerin is contraindicated in somebody who you suspect is having a posterior or inferior MI with posterior involvement. If they are in the situation we just described where the right coronary artery is blocked and the inferior portion of the heart is dead or dying, the only reason they're alive is Frank Starling mechanism. There's not a PCP student alive who couldn't tell me what nitro does, and it's a vasodilator. That's what you're always going to remember, and good for you, because it's true. Well, what is going to happen to that preload of the heart if you give somebody nitro? You give somebody nitro, it causes vasodilation everywhere, in particular in the venous system. That's going to open up all those blood vessels, so the bucket that once held the blood is now much bigger. Is the blood pressure going to rise or decrease? Well, it's going to decrease. And in doing so, there's going to be less of a return of blood to the heart. Once that blood is not getting to the heart, then you're going to lose Frank Starling mechanism. Once you lose Frank Starling's mechanism, and there's no more blood being pumped out of the right side of the heart, that means there's no more blood or at least significantly decreased amounts of blood being dropped into the left atria and the left ventricle. And then systemic circulation is just over, right? Your mean arterial pressure is going to drop below 60. Your blood pressure is definitely going to drop below 90. You're not going to be able to perfuse your organs. And you run a real risk of killing this person by giving him the nitro. If you don't kill him, you're still going to seriously, seriously harm them because by decreasing systemic circulation, you're going to decrease blood flow to the heart. And that's the last thing you want to do during a myocardial infarction. So that's why we do the 12 lead before nitro administration. That's why literally in your medical directive, it goes ASA 12 lead nitro. And uh, that's not just a suggestion. You should never give nitro without a 12 lead. You'll find in your CHF medical directive, you can. And uh, in your CHF medical directive, you should always suspect MI. But that's a different topic for a different day.